welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. It is a special opportunity to bring you a four-week series starting today on the topic, The State of Prejudice in America Today. These programs are possible because of the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment Incorporated that has recently held a three-day convention in our city. They have provided a number of speakers uh, at that convention and we are so happy and fortunate to have those on these four weeks of our programs. We'll start this week with two guests uh, that are very distinguished in the field of civil rights and have been very generous with their time to come by and to be on our program as well as address that convention. To my far left is John Eckerhawk who is of the Pawnee Tribe. He serves as the Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund located in Boulder, Colorado. Mr. Eckerhawk and his fine organization works in the field of Indian rights and legal issues throughout the United States. Mr. Eckerhawk, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. Thank you, Tony. Glad to be here. And our second guest is Mr. Ron Wakabaashi, who is from San Francisco, California, and he is the National Executive Director of the Japanese American Citizens League. And like our other guests, he is also very active and has been for years in the civil rights movement and particularly can address the issues of Asian Americans. And we're so delighted to have you in our city, in our state, and on our program. You have a beautiful city. I'm glad to be here. And I'm so happy to welcome to the program my friend, State Representative Jeannie Gibbons, who uh, is going to join today in question our guest. She represents the five northern counties of Idaho in the state legislature and is serving her second term. And I will ask Representative Gibbons to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here. Mr. Wakabayashi, again, welcome to North Idaho, and thank you for participating in this wonderful convention that, that was held here in town. What do you see today as one of the greatest threats to the progress made by Japanese Americans? Well, <clears throat> I, I think the major thing happening right now is, is that the, with, the, uh, with the increase in trade friction in the Pacific Rim, the development of the Pacific Rim, that uh, the unfortunate dynamic is that there is not a separation between economic issues and racial issues. Mm -hmm. And so the animosity that's generated by uh, the Japan bashing has a direct impact on uh, Japanese Americans or people who look like Japanese Americans, and, and I think that extends out further. Uh, and, you know, the, pl the, the most blatant example that would come to mind is the, the murder of Vincent Chin, a young Chinese American, by two unemployed auto workers. Uh, who held him responsible for the loss of their jobs and bludgeoned him to death with a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. And that, that case received a great deal of notoriety because um, those two men not, had not spent one day in jail. Mm -hmm. Ron, do you see uh, some potential fallout with the uh, stock, market of, uh, s stock market activities of a couple weeks ago? Well, you know, the, I, I think prejudice is economically sensitive. Mm -hmm. That, uh, if re you recall, when the the, uh, the fall of Saigon took place and the Vietnamese refugees were being brought into the United States, uh, that happened during a period of high unemployment, mm -hmm. and the con and the federal policy at that point was to disperse all the Vietnamese to the 50 states equally, which was not a practical solution, as it turns out, and and that was indicated to them then. So you you know, the stock market or or any kind of thing that's economically sensitive can have an impact, and certainly Pacific Rim economy is of the magnitude that uh, it can have direct impact on uh, you know, large in, in the large Asian American community. Thank you. John, in your address before the convention, you gave a very eloquent presentation, and uh, you addressed something that uh, many people uh, have ignored for a very long time, and that's the issue that under our federal system of having a national government and having state governments and the treaties uh, recognizing the uh, legal status of Indian tribes. Would you share with our television audience what you shared with the convention concerning uh, these questions and what is your organization doing in the field of legal issues concerning that matter? Sure, Tony. What I was doing was basically uh, uh, reciting legal fact that uh, under the Constitution and laws of our country, uh, tribes are essentially governments same kinds of governments uh, with sovereignty as the federal government itself, uh, the states, and, uh, and then the tribes, because tribes uh, have sovereignty. Uh, they were nations uh, self-governing at, uh, of course, all the time uh, predating the Constitution. 
1787, uh, founding fathers, what did they see out there? They saw Indian nations with sovereignty. So they recognized in the Constitution the sovereignty of Indian tribes and of course the history of this country that people are aware of is, is treaties with tribes and of course treaties are between governments and the fact is that uh, that relationship, that government to government relationship is still in effect. Uh, the treaties uh, for the most part are still in effect. Uh, they've been modified somewhat by Congress but not, not uh, completely and tribes are governments and uh, govern uh, their their territory and their people uh, in much the same way as other governments do. It's just that most American people, because of the movies and somehow some uh, vanishing American myth that they've created about Indian people, don't realize that there are 300 tribal governments in this country today. Also in your address as you, you dealt with those issues, you indicated that uh, as your uh, foundation has been dealing with the issue that there was such lack of understanding even by those in positions that you would think they would be, such as some of the governor's offices and government mm -hmm. officials. Uh, what was the reason for that and, and, and more importantly, what kind of progress are you making uh, to bring about uh, a different attitude uh, from uh, many decision makers? Mm -hmm. I uh, think again it's, it's uh, uh, the product of uh, of really kind of bad public relations uh, uh, in terms of our Indian people and again the, the myth about Indians being vanished Americans which just isn't true. Uh, tribes have continued to exist even though they've suffered for such a long period of time up to the 1960s under a federal policy which tried to force assimilation of Indian people away from Indian ways and to eliminate their tribal governments or to ignore their tribal governments and the right to, to make their own decisions about their own lands and their own lives. But that has changed as a result of the civil rights movement and the enlightenment of Americans today. Uh, but uh, when we started this kind of legal work on the treaty rights in the 1970s, uh, uh, most public officials we met in the western states for the most part uh, were suffering under this vanishing American mentality and had no idea that tribes were governments that we had rights of self-government and that we had rights under our treaties to resources, uh, substantial rights, and somehow they couldn't uh, fathom it that uh, we had governmental jurisdiction and we had substantial rights to resources, land, water, and hunting and fishing rights that we were serious about and they were right there in the law books. And after we went to court a few times over uh, 10 or 15 years and won most of those cases, then they finally understood what we were talking about and now we're in a position where uh, we can sit down across, uh, across a table on an equal basis and they understand that we are what we said we were and we're here to stay and remarkably most of them are ready to work with us now and figure out how tribes and states can live together uh, in the future. Thank you. Representative Gibbon. Ron, would you give us an update on the redress campaign uh, to remedy the injustices for the wartime internment? Japanese Americans. I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, I think uh, there's there's really two levels of that. On the legislative side, uh, the uh, bill passed overwhelmingly in, in the uh, House of Representatives mm -hmm. <clears throat> on September 17th, the uh, the exact date of the bicentennial of the Constitution, and uh, I think that was an appropriate date for it to pass. It's uh, due in the Senate any time now, and there there are some uh, 79 co-sponsors to the Senate version of the bill. So we expect success in both houses of the Congress. The other level that I alluded to was, and I think that, you know, an equally exciting aspect is you know making a people whole again. The, you know the uh, the fact of the internment, the violation of civil rights, and, and what you know the whole trauma of internment uh, makes uh, you know makes humanizes makes us understand what you know what in what ways civil rights are important and how they affect people. And I've seen the damage to, to my community and I've seen the community begin to heal itself through this process. And that process has been an ex especially exciting one where you're seeing people seize back what um, they can self-determine in terms of their own sense of themselves and their own dignity. And I think that's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Ron, what do your critics say about you, the people who are opposed to that kind of legislation, the uh, retribution? Well, the, the uh, most common comment is, is really a response of, well, what about what happened to American prisoners of war in Bataan and in the Pacific Theater? 
uh, why should we compensate you when the Japanese did that? And, and it's really that same problem they addressed earlier, that there's an absence of separation. We were Americans uh, protected by the U.S. Constitution. The Japanese nation was an enemy nation, and there's no question about that. But there's absolutely no separation between the two. Uh, Japanese Americans took the largest casualty at Pearl Harbor because we have a large Japanese American population in Hawaii. Uh, Japanese Americans became the most decorated unit in the Pacific theater of battle in terms of military service. Uh, but in, in the same way John was talking about the kind of misperceptions that exist about Native Americans, the same thing happens to other minority people in the United States. And the consequence of that, I think, is, is unfortunate because it makes you feel like you don't really quite belong here, that you're not quite a real American. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this process has helped make people whole again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Something that's of great concern to me, and I know this new coalition that we have put together is certainly going to address mm -hmm. that. We've had periods where, at least from the perspective of many of us, there seemed to be some very significant progress. There was some very important legislation in the 1960s, such mm -hmm. as civil rights legislation in 64 and 65 in particular, and human rights got a great deal of attention in governmental bodies and the media and so forth. And then we've gone through a period, in, in my humble opinion, in which uh, there has been a neglect and there has even been surfacing uh, uh, racism uh, among groups that in the 60s uh, had become silent in that area. Um, do you s sense that that is a correct uh, uh, observation? This question is to both of you. And if so, uh, I, again, I have a two-part question. Why is that happening? And two, how can we best deal with that problem? Well, yeah, right. if I could start, you know, I, I think that you know, there is something in the environment where you can see the growth of organized hate groups. You know, and, and I think that you want to differentiate that between that and the kinds of conflicts that happen in our communities as we go through the, the evolutions and changes in neighborhoods and immigration mm -hmm. and all that. We're talking about organized hate groups mm -hmm. uh, developing as a phenomenon. And it seems to me that uh, the kind of messages that have been coming from our federal government in terms of the kind of benign neglect that's taking place there, because I agree with your perception, really plays to the most backward in our population. Because I, I really think that most Americans are really, you know, fair-minded and, and not mean-spirited. But what the message coming out of Washington today, I think, you know, appeals to the most backward segments and reinforces some of that segment uh, to be encouraged to form some of, of, you know, the organized hate groups. And I think that's a real danger and concern for all of us. John, you, you alluded to that certainly in your address and some of the bumper stickers and so forth, that blatant racism out mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you respond to, to this general question? Well, I, I would agree with Ron. I, I think uh, most of it has to... Uh, has to uh, be put at the feet of, uh, of the messages coming out of Washington today, and that is that uh, uh, somehow this country has gone too far in terms of uh, civil rights and human rights, and uh, that somehow that direction was wrong and needed to be slowed down or reversed. And I, I think uh, messages have come out of Washington basically to that effect. And uh, I think uh, people who are uh, against uh, human rights and equal rights and, and against minorities basically have seen that as uh, an encouraging sign an encouraging signal and tried to uh, push that just as far as they could but again it unfortunately comes from some of our leaders and the signals they've sent knowingly or unknowingly. Representative Gibbon. Is the pendulum swinging for uh, swinging, swinging back to uh, a broader awareness of human rights of all people of all races? And if so, what do you think are some of the key indicators of that, Ron? Well, you know, one of the things that's happening in this country since 1965 with the liberalization of the immigration laws is that increasingly the demographics of this country are becoming minority dominated. You know, the, uh, the, Euro the European immigration era you know, is over. Uh, immigration now comes across the Pacific. It's a Pacific Rim immigration from, you know, Hispanics from uh, Central and South America as well as from Asian countries. And, and certainly you know, that, that phenomenon changing demographics uh, and really looking at it in an economic sense and, and our own economic interests on the West Coast in particular, and I think the states of Washington and, and Idaho, where this coalition serves, is, is, are particularly affected, that there really is an interest in having uh, that sort of diversity because it works for you. It helps build that local economy because trade is, is in that direction. In 1981, trade exceed, you know, uh, 
uh, across the uh, Pacific, exceed the trade across the Atlantic for the first time in the 200 plus year history of the U.S. So we're in the Pacific era and we stand to benefit uh, from this diversity. Uh, but it's, it's a difficult problem, it's, it's complicated, but I think increasingly we're starting to understand that in order to live with that diversity we need to be very conscious of human rights, of pluralism and the kind of cooperativeness that we need to work on. John? Well, I, I think that's right too. Uh, uh, I think we've got a situation where uh, uh, America is at the point where uh, cultural pluralism, I, I think, is is uh, the policy that the country wants to pursue uh, and is being pursued for the most part uh, through our elected leaders, but there, again, are still uh, remnants of this racism, I, I think, is, is what we've got to call it, uh, that still exists in some quarters. Uh, and some people just don't understand uh, uh, the direction, really the dream uh, that America's realizing here in terms of uh, all different kinds of people living under, under one banner and as, uh, as one nation. And that is uh, people made up of all different kinds of uh, backgrounds, uh, races, creeds, colors, and that is, in fact, America. And America is not just one particular kind of person. Uh, it's all kinds of people. That's, that's what America is. Thank you. One thing addressed at the convention that's of <coughs> very, very great importance, and uh, it's also disturbing, and that is the uh, statistics indicator, those that I have seen uh, from various civil rights organizations, and some even coming out of government and the Justice Department, that there has been in some areas and parts of the country a growth in uh, or an increase in violence directed at uh, minorities in the United States. Would you both address that and do you have any statistics to indicate uh, from, from your perspective is that correct and if in violence has increased particularly what groups have been most targeted? Let, let, me, let me try that from this angle. I think John and I represent the population that is often categorized as other when you, when you look on, on the forms that are filled out. And as the other category, one of the problems that you have is really the absence of good data. Uh, yes. and, and really the whole psychological sense of what other means. It means that you really aren't that important to have a designation. Mm -hmm. And there's a subtle psychological effect from that. Uh, but even with that, you know, in terms of the Asian American community, if you've seen about the bombing a month of a Korean store in the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia suburbs in that area. In New Jersey, in the last 12 months, you've seen a number of, of Indian women, uh, meaning Asian Indians, uh, you know, and they call it dot bashing, you know, they wear a religious dot on their forehead, that that's a phenomenon that's taking place almost on a monthly basis. In South Central Los Angeles, you've seen uh, Korean merchants uh, killed, a dozen killed in 1986, and the LA County Commission on Human Relations reported a 326 percent increase in acts of violence against Asian Americans in that city. But that's a phenomenon that's, that's part of the immigration wave, part of the backlash to that, the xenophobia that's developing, and in part you know, the kind of, of, of uh, effect of you know, the backlash against them, the trade conflict. But certainly there, there's a rising tide. To the extent that the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, as currently composed, uh, was even compelled to do a report on that subject. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, I would think there's, there's been some, some resurgence of that. Uh, uh, I had uh, mentioned uh, to the convention the experience that's happening in Wisconsin mm -hmm. now with the uh, uh, backlash among, uh, uh, an or by an organization against uh, the Chippewa tribe's uh, success in the courts in terms of enforcing their hunting and fishing rights under treaties going back to uh, 1836. And what it reminds me of is what was happening uh, in the 1960s when the Civil Rights Movement was starting and the Indian Rights Movement started as well. And of course, we're all familiar with some of the violence that happened then. Uh, but, but I think as the Indian Rights Movement uh, uh, continued and, and the uh, basic acceptance of, uh, of uh, the role of the courts in enforcing law and people's respect for law increased, uh, I think the amount of violence decreased uh, up until here sometime beginning in 1986 again, why this happened in Wisconsin, uh, I'm not really sure, but I, I can only attribute it to, again, some of our leaders in Washington 
saying and doing things that encourage these kind of, uh, of racist organizations. And again, as I mentioned in Wisconsin, what's sad is that there's a Republican congressman who has basically taken up that banner and introduced a bill in the Congress to break the Chippewa treaties and to take their property rights back that they just finally won in court after 150 years. Representative Jeannie Gibbons was uh, the champion, I would have to say, in the House our last session. She uh, really coordinated on the floor of the House so many pieces of legislation, and we were very excited uh, in January, February, March 1987, where we had a package of legislation, and uh, we didn't get every single thing we wanted, but we got some very, very significant things, and one of them was a civil remedies law, and another one was an anti-domestic law, uh, without taking too much valuable time from the program. Uh, and we have a, a malicious harassment law we got in 83. When you put this package together, we have both uh, criminal provisions to deal with mm -hmm. hate groups and violence, and there's now, I think it's a $50,000 fine and 10 years in prison for engaging in paramilitary uh, training operations in the state. But I think probably the most significant of all is the fact that we have a civil remedies law that both the individual and the organization that directs violence toward person or persons uh, that the individual can sue for three things. They can sue for uh, actual damages, but they experience punitive damages and attorney's fees. And I think we may be in the forefront in that kind of legislation. And Representative Givens was very involved with that. Uh, really, my, I, I sell that to say this. What is the situation around the country? Are a number of states moving in this area? And do you think that that civil area in particular is a way to get to the root of uh, uh, the harassment? I think certainly that's one of the areas. You know, the state of Massachusetts, you know, with their uh, a new uh, civil rights director in the attorney general's office, has certainly you know, moved into that area, looking at public accommodations as a basis to to provide you know protections against the kind of harassment issues that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, and in some police departments, you know, that you've seen some special orders that are being um, imposed to require that sort of investigation because most of the police departments are not required to do that to look at you know racial or religious you know and th those aspects of a crime uh, and it simply doesn't get p picked up as data uh, so I think data collection and there's there's a federal hate crimes act uh, that Mineta and uh, representative um, I think it's Connolly are, are proposing and I know in several states there's the other pieces to pick up the database as well so I think those two areas are important John I think that's a, that's a tremendous development at the state level because uh, uh, I think for the most part the, uh, the civil rights laws, things that uh, uh, protected individuals from that kind of uh, mm -hmm. treatment uh, were the, for the most part all that existed. But again, there's no constitutional bar to states becoming involved in legislating in the same areas. Mm -hmm. And I think sending that message out even further to people across the country in whatever state you may be that you not only... Uh, 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 face penalties under federal law for that, but also under the state laws, almost no matter where you go. And again, I think that that sends a message to people uh, about what's proper conduct and what's what's not tolerated. One of our theories has been here, and I know that Jeannie and I talked about this a number of times, if you're successful in getting that legislation, and we have been quite successful, I, I think states that refuse to respond that they are opening themselves up for possible movement of groups like that into their state. I'm, I tend to think they may flee from states where the, le the legislation is tough. Jeannie Gibbons. Oh, good point, Tony. Uh, the people who are involved with the hate groups are pretty well aware of the laws that exist in the states. And the word is out that uh, Idaho does have a, a uh, racial harassment law with stiff civil pen mm. penalties and criminal penalties. So uh, anyway. My point and my question to both of you is you've been involved in civil rights and the promotion of your groups, the promotion of equality for both of your groups. What do you think is the formula for, for uh, preserving human rights for both of your groups, the Japanese American, the American Indian? What do you think we can be doing today to, to have better relations in the future 20, 30 years down the road? Well, I, I, you have to look at um, the Asian American community because you know, we, we've got two segments. We've got a large newcomer group, and we have uh, an equally large number of American-born, uh, and they have two really different kinds of experiences. But in, in both cases, I think ultimately what we want to get to is to understand that, um, in the context of this country in particular, that there is a real benefit to all of us 
to, uh, to understand and develop this concept of cultural pluralism that um, it's important for us, one, to acknowledge that we have some deficiencies, that we really don't know Native American history, and we don't know the details and sensitivities of that. That's absent in our educational system, and that, that runs across the board for other minority groups, uh, for Western Europeans, if we want to go into mm -hmm. that, that whole history of early immigration there, uh, of people with different gender preferences. That's part of America. Uh, and, and an understanding that our rights are, and our interests are intimately linked together, that once you see an erosion in one area, that, that, that really is the foundation for erosion. I mean, you may be tenth in line, and if you take solace in that, that's really not much solace, even, even if there's a rotation basis for discrimination. Uh, that, that really doesn't make a lot of sense, because they're going to get to you eventually. And so I think that's the kind of public education that we have to do internally within our own communities. Mm -hmm. So you say more education and expanded education. Yeah, and I think we have a particular burden in our community since we have a large number of newcomers. A lot of the people who are foreign born really are absent a multicultural experience. This is a, a very different world for them now, and, and I think one that is very insecure and very threatening to them. And especially those of us who are American born, I think, need to share that it really isn't scary, and really the other side of it is that it's really very exciting, very interesting, and very rich. Mm -hmm. John, what's your formula for preserving human relations, human rights? for the next 20, 30 years? Well, I, I think much of it is, is in the educational area and in programs like we're doing today, I think, is mm -hmm. information uh, gets out to people because uh, uh, much of the kind of uh, problem we're dealing with, I, I think, is really one of attitudes. And if pe as people find out more, uh, I think they can uh, uh, perhaps have a chance to get rid of some of the old attitudes, some of the old biases that they have. and. Uh, I really think that has to be uh, uh, most of it. I think it's real important to do that in the educational process with the younger children and uh, basically to teach them what, what the law of this country is and that is, that is equality and that uh, America is made up of uh, uh, really a diverse number of, uh, of groups of people and uh, uh, that we're all the same. Uh, that's not always what has been taught in our schools, unfortunately, uh, over the years, uh, but something could be changed now, and uh, I think particularly in the case of, uh, of Native Americans, uh, much, much work needs to be done on the, on the history of our people as portrayed in the textbooks and our status in society today, because I have yet to see an American textbook that does it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I wish we had more time. We just got started, but we're out of time. And on behalf of Jeannie Givens and the staff, we thank both of you so much. You've been so informative and so helpful. And we want to welcome you back to our city in the future. We hope you really will come back. Ladies and gentlemen, our guests, John Eckerhawk, Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund from Boulder, Colorado, and Ron Wakabayashi, National Executive Director of the Japanese American Citizens League, have been our guests. Hope you'll be with us next week, and we will continue this issue with some additional guests. Have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.